The theme we are using this month is commitment. And there are two quotes that I was variously looking at when I was deciding on the title of this sermon. Here's a little side note. I don't like to create titles for sermons uh, because I never quite know where they're going to go and the, the title needs to be in early. But let me share these two titles, these two quotes, and, and we'll see what we can make of them. J.P. Morgan said, the first step toward getting somewhere is to decide that you are not going to stay where you are. The first step toward getting somewhere is to decide that you are not going to stay where you are. And Goethe, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, said, until one is committed, there is hesitant, hesitancy, a chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. That the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves to. I'm going to read it again because it's loaded and I, and I like this so much I want us to get it. Until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. That the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves to. Each of us is committed to many things, family, including pets, home, community, work, values, the environment, justice for all people, making the perfect sourdough loaf or pie crust, uh, finishing that crossword puzzle, uh, finishing the thousand piece jigsaw puzzle within a day, whatever it is, many of us, we all have our individual commitments. But we weren't always committed to those things. Perhaps in their stead, we were committed to other things or to nothing at all. You might think of the times in your life that you made a decision, made a commitment that that took, that landed in your life in such a way that your life made a turn. When the earth shifted ever so slightly and, and you knew that things would be different from here on out. Perhaps the commitment you made was set in your own lap. It wasn't one that you would have sought out for yourself. But a situation was presented to you, and then you had a choice. Would you commit to owning that, or would you go in a different direction? Many of us have better choices than other people. Many of us understand our privilege to be one of having had good choices. But surely, we all have choices in our lives. And and if, you, if I don't make a choice uh, wholeheartedly, as Goethe says, there's always ineffectiveness. When he says that when we do make a commitment, then all sorts of other things come into our path, things we could never have imagined. I can see that too. He says providence moves. For people of Goethe's age, providence meant God. I wonder for me how that means I see possibilities open up once I am committed to something. I'm not sure that God puts something in my path for me to choose, but I see possibilities perhaps that were there all along. A commitment is a pledge an obligation, an assurance that we will show up for something, a family, a pet, a puzzle, a value, a creed. There's a 
phrase that's being spoken quite a lot in the uh, uh, in our vernacular these days, I actually wonder if this may be the uh, dictionary word of the year, inflection point. We hear this in our political life quite a lot. Our current president says we are at an inflection point. I didn't know what that meant. I could kind of suss it out. I could discern it. But I kept hearing the word inflection and missing the word point. Inflection, like the pitch or tone of voice, right? I understand speaking and inflection. But I, I've recently learned that this usage comes from math. It comes from mathematics. The point on a curve at which the curvature changes from convex to concave. It's the point on a curve when the direction of the curve changes, right? It's a moment of dramatic change in a life, in a country, in a movement. I heard Reverend David Breeden, the senior minister at First Unitarian Society, preach a really excellent sermon this week, and I was inspired by what he was saying about liberal religion, that where we find ourselves, liberal religion, and, and how it can help us understand the inflection points in our own lives, both help to buttress where we are and to, to help us move forward. He, he asks, what do we find when the fog is blown away? David says, I think religion is about three things, saving yourself, saving each other, and saving the world. What makes Unitarian Universalism unique among the world's religion is religious traditions is how our Universalist and Unitarian ancestors went about doing those three things, saving ourselves, saving each other, and saving the world. Our minister theologian who shaped Unitarian Universalist theology, one of which was James Luther Adams. Adams wrote what remains the clearest articulation of Unitarian Universalism and liberal Protestantism in general in five smooth stones. Now, those of you who are biblically versed may recognize that five smooth stones were the stones that David organized in his slingshot to slay Goliath from the story in 1 Samuel. James Luther Adams talked about the five smooth stones of Unitarian Universalism, of religious liberalism. Religious liberalism depends on the principle that revelation is continuous. Our religious tradition is a living tradition because we are always learning new truths. Re revelation is not sealed, it is continuous. All relations between persons ought ideally to rest on mutual free consent and not coercion. We freely choose to enter into relationship with one another. Religious liberalism affirms the moral obligation to direct one's efforts toward the establishment of a just and loving community. It is this which makes the role of the prophet central and indispensable in liberalism. We seek justice. We deny the immaculate conception of virtue and affirm the necessity of social incarnation. We have agency. Good things don't just happen. We make them happen. We are responsible for making them happen. Liberalism holds that the resources, divine and human, that are available for the achievement of meaningful change justify an attitude of ultimate optimism. We have hope. So those again are re revelation is continuous. Relationships ought to rest on free and mutual consent. We need to work together for a just and loving community. We have a commitment to express our faith in society. 
and we live in hope. David continues, these five points come closest, I think, to a concise and challenging articulation of what liberal religion or is, or at least it aspires to be. That we have this set of ideals that we are committed to. We belong to these ideals and they belong to us and they help create this community that we are together. We are committed to them and they are what help us make a difference in our own lives, in the lives of each other and the lives of the world. There's so many things to say about commitment, but this is the story of commitment that I want to tell today. A decision of people not to stay in the same place, but to make a difference. People who decided that they were fully in, they were all in, they were so committed, and then so many things changed to help make their commitment be realized. 56 years ago today, March 7th, 1965, some 600 voting rights activists began their 50 mile march to Montgomery by crossing the Edmus Pettus, Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. They were commemorating the murder by police of an unarmed man named Jimmy Lee Jackson, who was protecting his mother during a peaceful voting rights march. We now know that the end of the beginning of the Selma to Montgomery March as Bloody Sunday, when Alabama state troopers beat, gassed, and charged the, the marchers on horseback. Among the people hospitalized was John Lewis, who suffered a skull fracture from a nightstick. The nation was horrified by the television coverage of the attack. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King called for activists and religious leaders from all over the country to come to Selma to complete the march. At that time, the Unitarian Universalist Association Board was meeting in Boston. They recessed their meeting in Boston and reconvened in Selma, the whole UUA board. Two white Unitarian Universalists were martyred in Selma in the struggle for voting rights. Boston minister James Reeb and Viola Liuzzo, a Unitarian Universalist for, from Detroit who answered this call for justice. In this Women's History Month, I want to lift up the story of Miss Liuzzo, a forgotten, mostly forgotten soldier in the civil rights movement. She was a new Unitarian Universalist. She had been a Catholic. Um, she grew up in, in Tennessee and West Virginia, and so she was pretty familiar with uh, racism and segregation and the ways that different uh, races were treated, but she had never seen the kind of segregation and racism she met when she moved to Detroit. The mother of five, she was a former Catholic, but found that she was not hearing the, the call and the opportunity to justice in her Catholic Church. And so she joined the Unitarian Universalist Church. And after Dr. King made his plea for religious people to come, she drove her car from Detroit to Alabama. She used her car to ferry civil rights workers where they needed to go. On the march from Selma to Montgomery, and after Dr. King came, they did continue that march. They did get across the bridge, as you know, and continue. But not everybody walked all 50 miles, right? Some would walk away, and there was some more to pick up. And, they, and so she was ferrying people back and forth. On the night of March 25th, 1965, Viola Liuzzo and her black passenger, a teenager named Leroy Moten, were run off the road by a car full of Klansmen, including an FBI informant. And Ms. Liuzzo and Mr. Moten were murdered. Ms. Liuzzo was the only white woman killed in the civil rights movement, and her name and reputation were subsequently dragged through the mud, sullied by the FBI. 
Her commitment to join the fight for voting rights, the most sacred cornerstone of our democracy, led to her death and also led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act. These murders in Alabama of these two white Unitarian Universalists, Reverend James Reeb in Selma and Viola Liuzzo, so shocked the country. Hear this dynamic that it was the murder of white people and not the routine murder of black people that so shocked the country that Lyndon jo Johnson was able to move through the Voting Rights Act as quickly as he was. It is said that Bar the Barack Obama campaign sent flowers to Miss Liuzzo's family following his election as the 44th president of the United States, recognizing her sacrifice as an integral part of moving the arc of justice, of putting her hands to the arc of justice, the arc of history and bending it toward justice. I'll say to you that there is a current movement to have the name of the Edmund Pettus Bridge over the Alabama River renamed for John Lewis. Edmund Pettus was a Confederate general and a grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Wouldn't it be something to have it renamed after John Lewis? I mentioned earlier that tomorrow the in Minneapolis, the Derek Chauvin trial begins. Please, if you have an opportunity to speak of this, don't refer to it as the George Floyd trial. Mr. Floyd is not on trial. Uh, a Minneapolis police officer who murdered him is on trial. It was a film made by a teenager on the sidewalk that so shocked the nation that we saw the casualness with which a Minneapolis police officer killed an unarmed black man. This is not over. We, we are news watching people, you know the attacks on voting rights continue. And yet we are committed, we are committed to putting the lawn signs out and continuing to talk about it, continuing to talk about fairness in representation. Please do not hear me suggest that we must give up our lives to show that we are fully committed. May not one of us ever again be murdered by white supremacists, whether they wear a uniform or not. And our call, as revelation is continuous, as we are in mutual relationship, as we are called to speak out injustice, as we are called to join together in community like these new members have done, like, like we show up each week but because we are committed to having language to deepening our commitment to knowing that our voice makes a difference in the world, makes a difference in our families, makes a difference to our pets, makes a difference in our jobs, makes a difference in our neighborhoods. We show up here because we are stronger together. We get our buckets filled so we can go out into the world and continue being the change, continue rising to be the change that we need. Dr. King said this as he spoke the eulogy for Reverend James Reeb. So in his death, James Reeb says something to each of us, black and white alike, that we must substitute courage for caution. Says to us that we must be concerned not merely with who murdered him, but about the system, the way of life, the philosophy that produced the murder. His death says to us that we must work passionately, unrelentingly to make the American dream a reality so that he did not die in vain. <laughs>